Spain soon, people are, will be going out. Uh, the United States, well, it's a bit of a, a sort of a patchwork of what's going on in my country, the United Kingdom, where um, we're all uh, locked down and, and for some, the effects of that have been almost catastrophic. Um, uh, loss of work, uh, insane pressures of being uh, um, caught in in a small flat with lots of kids or whatever. Um, and in some ways, we're living through a really terrible time in many ways, in whole heaps of ways. But in other ways, too, something rather extraordinary has been happening, and I'm going to be talking about that this morning for a bit. Because in the midst of this situation, we seem to have discovered something else about ourselves. We seem to have discovered the importance of contact and bizarrely community. Uh, and again, I'll be talking about that in a minute. I think we've begun to realize with an added urgency how much we all depend upon people who are by tradition lowly paid and do what are supposedly humble jobs. But it turns out that we need them more than ever uh, and, the, uh, and our appreciation of their efforts the health workers, the dustmen, the, the people who work at supermarket tills, all of those people, our appreciation of these people has, has, has risen enormously. The only hope we can have, uh, though some world leaders seem to be bucking this trend, um, is, that, is that this situation we're confronting has developed a new humanity in us, uh, a new understanding of, of our precariousness, uh, uh, a new understanding of how much we all need each other. That's what we hope, and, and let's pray that that is the case. Our task this morning is to try and work out who we still are in the midst of this bizarre and completely unprecedented crisis i swore i wouldn't use the word unprecedented people don't seem to know it's it's the new cliche of what david crystal would call a lexical zombie this unprecedented crisis but i there you are i've used it just can't help myself um a question of trying to work out where we are as as uh, um uh teachers in all of this uh and i'm there we go and now I've got movement. So, in the midst of what we all know to be a serious situation, tinged with, with aspects of hope and an awful lot of love, uh, what about us? What about our world? What about the world that we uh, inhabit and exist and have taken, I guess, a little bit for granted until now when suddenly it all appeared to come crashing down around our ears. I was thinking about this, uh, as you'll see in a minute, because of the response of one of my students. Uh, I, I teach on an online MA at a university in New York, so that teaching online uh, for me is nothing new, though, of course, teaching on an MA is, is an entirely different kettle of fish from teaching a bunch of uh, not terribly engaged teenagers, for example. So I, I was thinking about uh, how to approach this topic. And as you'll see the, my reasons in a minute, but it, what suddenly came to my mind bizarrely was uh, this gentleman. Now, uh, some of the younger teachers among you probably don't have the slightest idea who he is, but his name was Cassius Clay, a slave name. And he changed it to Muhammad Ali. As it happens, uh, I'm not a fan of boxing and not enormously interested in boxing, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but the one thing about Muhammad Ali in his prime, and he was a beautiful young man 
and unbelievably bouncy and cheeky and cocky and and just way too much which is to say he was enormously good fun uh, and and terribly good with with his words and and his little sayings and one of the great sayings he he made i believe he was on a tv program being interviewed and he he liked to boast about himself about how great he was and one of the things he said was float like a butterfly sting like a bee hands can't hit what his eyes can't see uh, and and i wish you those of you who don't really know anything about him could hear the way he said it it was just uh terribly funny i should say by the way that that uh, muhammad ali um uh was very good at being funny and i think the thing that made the one that makes me giggle most uh, remember his whole sort of thing was to say how incredible he was and it, i guess it was supposed to frighten his opponents and you know give him a psychological advantage anyway uh, my favorite saying of his which just makes me laugh was this one uh there you are It makes me laugh, and if it doesn't make you laugh, uh, well, that's probably because you're more sensible than me and more and more um, intelligent or something. But I just think it's so funny. Any rate, enough of that. Uh, uh, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Hands can't hit what his eyes can't see. Uh, so it seemed to me that when we look at what's happening to teachers who are suddenly uh, being thrust into teaching online, some of them, by the way, brackets, some people have been teaching online for a long time. Uh, and for them, uh, the situation is grave as it is for all of us, but they're not having to uh, suddenly reinvent themselves in the way that so many teachers are. Uh, Pearson, as, as you're all very well aware, uh, has, has a long history already uh, in, in uh, uh, working out sort of parameters of online learning and teaching. But for some teachers, this has been a bit of a shock. Uh, let's be quite frank, a bit of a shock. Uh, one of my students on the MA who teaches uh, in, um, in New York, as it happens, um, she had this to say, and I'm going to put up a, a little paragraph on the screen and give you time to read it because it's worth reading. There's the B. Let's start with Bs. Sting, sting. And I think what she says is is a sort of heartfelt cry that most of you, most of us understand entirely. Students say, we're not learning anything, it doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. And she says, it stings to hear that. Since I'm trying so hard to still provide some semblance of a meaningful education to them, but I know that we're all still adjusting. We are still all adjusting, even if we're getting our adjustment has accelerated rapidly as the weeks uh, as the days pass into weeks and months of of this situation we're in so that's i guess the stinging part of of where teachers are at the moment but it's not all uh, um it's not all ouch 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 um here's a butterfly now some of you may have attended uh, an iotafel online event uh, some two weeks ago, um, and the closing panel uh, has been put on YouTube, uh, so anyone can watch it, whether you're a member of that teachers' association or not. And it was a really fine panel about teaching online and how to approach it. And one of the questions that the panelists were asked, uh, here they are, uh, one of the questions that the panelists were asked is, what do you miss? Uh, about face-to-face -face teaching, because of course no one's doing any face-to-face -face teaching. What do you miss about it? And uh, uh, various people said things, but the one I want to concentrate on is the one second from left. Uh, she's a woman called Sandy Millen, and she's the director of studies at International House Bydgoszcz in Poland. And, and uh, this is what she said. The question, if you remember, is what do you miss about face-to-face -face teaching? And she said, Uh, 
and her basic argument is actually it's great uh this is not uh, this is a, a terrible thing that's happening to the world but in terms of education because people will always need education people will always want education in terms of education actually teaching online can give you great student to student interaction i love this thing it's easier to have snowball fights online i know exactly what she means by that that there's a whole lot of things you can do online uh, uh, that are much more difficult to do in class uh, let me just say about my own experience i started teaching uh, online uh, quite a few years ago now and i did it uh, with reluctance uh, but I thought I should because at the time online teaching was something new and I just thought well if I want to stay current in this profession I'd better enter that zone and work out how to deal with it and the one thing I knew wouldn't work online was discussion because I was wedded to the idea that discussion had to be face to face you have to be able to look at each other see each other it's never going to work you know and to my surprise Admittedly, it's not face-to-face -face discussion. It, it's asynchronous uh, uh, typed uh, discussion board stuff. But to my surprise, it's some of the best discussions about learning and teaching I've seen have been on our discussion boards uh, at the new school in New York, uh, where students uh, exchange opinions and, and, and information with each other and with us, their tutors. It's been absolutely wonderful. So, there are advantages to all this and sandy millen who i will put up a reference to at the end i think has been an absolute superstar uh, currently in in this new world we're finding ourselves and finding out ways of of using the benefits of of online teaching using zoom using breakout rooms using the ability we'll come to that in a minute so there we are uh, bees uh, and, and butterflies or butterflies. Does it sting or does it make you see beauty and be happy? Let's take a step back. And I want to, if you, you'll allow me, I want to kind of just talk, I want to talk about myself for a little bit. It's obviously my favorite subject. And um, so I just want to talk about myself for a little bit and I hope you'll understand why. So um, I don't know whether anyone would recognize this place. A beautiful, beautiful day. They're very English, but well, it's not very English, it's just a place. A river, uh, um, some gardens, uh, trees in bloom, all that kind of thing. It's This is the place. Does this make it any easier for any of you? Uh, in case you don't know where that is, uh, that is the Royal Shakespeare Theatre in Stratford-on-Avon in the United Kingdom. <coughs> Stratford-on-Avon, about the middle of our peculiarly shaped island uh well it's it's not really the middle but anyway that'll just have to do <coughs> excuse me uh Stravenaven is the place where i grew up uh and which i love and which has given me an enduring love of the plays of shakespeare because as you know, it's where shakespeare was born um and uh, uh and in Sh in Stratford-on-Avon is this building this is Barclays Bank. Now, this may be, I was thinking about this, and this is probably the first time I've ever mentioned a bank in a talk on language teaching. However, this is Barclays Bank. And this was the very same building painted in the same colors that my father took me to when I was a teenager to open my first ever bank account. And in those days, this was a big sort of coming of age moment. And for some of you, this may come as a surprise, but let me explain how it worked in those days. You were given a checkbook and you were introduced to the staff of the bank. And if I wanted to get any money, any money at all, Uh, trees in bloom, all that kind of thing. It's This is the place. Does this make it any easier for any of you? Uh, in case you don't know where that is, uh, that is the Royal Shakespeare Theatre in Stratford-on-Avon in the United Kingdom. <coughs> Stratford-on-Avon, about the middle of our peculiarly shaped island. Uh, 
well, it's it's not really the middle, but anyway, that'll just have to do. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Stravenhaven is the place where I grew up uh, and which I love and which has given me an enduring love of the plays of Shakespeare because as you know, it's where Shakespeare was born. Um, and uh, uh, and in, in Stratford-on-Avon is this building. This is Barclays Bank. Now this may be, I was thinking about this and this is probably the first time I've ever mentioned a bank in a talk on language teaching. However, this is Barclays Bank. And this was the very same building painted in the same colors that my father took me to when I was a teenager to open my first ever bank account. And in those days, this was a big sort of coming of age moment. And for some of you, this may come as a surprise, but let me explain how it worked in those days. You were given a checkbook and you were introduced to the staff of the bank. And if I wanted to get any money, any money at all, I had to go to that bank with my checkbook, sign a check, and they would give me money. There were no cash machines. If you got money out on a Friday and you ran out on Saturday evening, that was just tough. You had no money till you could go back to the bank on Monday. If I left Stratford-on-Avon and went to, say, a big city nearby like Birmingham, uh, and I wanted to go in a bank, they wouldn't give me any money unless they rang my bank and I had some identity and they could check who I was and things like that. And it's, okay, it's a long time ago. I'm about 150, but but it's a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. It's certainly within my, uh, my living memory. And then suddenly we had bank machines and suddenly we had all that. And now, of course, we just pick up one of these phones and we do all our banking like that. Why am I telling you this? It's, we all know perfectly well about this story. We know perfectly well about this because uh, what happens uh, when these innovations come through, uh, it changes come through, is we react with shock. We react with, oh my, my word, good heavens. But within almost no time at all, we adapt to uh, what is now being talked about in terms of the coronavirus uh, outbreak, we adapt to the new normal. The new normal uh, for the world of coronavirus, we don't quite yet understand what it's going to be like. But the new normal in terms of banking for me, though not in all countries in the world, <clears throat> but the new normal for me is I've got a phone in my pocket. If I want to do almost anything to do with my money, I just get my phone out and go click, 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 and it's all done. And it hasn't hurt that much, just a little bit at the beginning. Uh, but this is different. This coronavirus is different. This, this trying to teach suddenly, suddenly shot to the system, trying to suddenly teach online when we, for those of us who hadn't had, for those of you who hadn't had experience before, that's different, isn't it? Uh, look at this. This is a teacher in Italy who wrote me this email. This is part of an email she wrote to me. She was talking about a song I'd put on on uh, on YouTube, and I'll be talking more about songs in a little bit. Searching for ideas for not an ugly lesson plan on COVID nineteen, and um, but it's the next bit. Like so many of us ESL teachers, I've had to shift to online teaching overnight without nearly any competences. Hmm. Well, uh, is it that different? Here's a rather poor photograph I took of a banner in a place called Abtabad, which as I'm sure you instantly know is in Pakistan. Uh, and it's not a very good uh, um, uh, banner, but I'll try and give you a clearer view. Does that make it any clearer? We extend a warm welcome to our worthy guest. No one's ever called me a worthy guest before. I'm very honored. This was some years ago. Our worthy guest, Jeremy Harmer, blah, 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 to us. And the school was called Modern Age, Abtabad. Uh, and I was privileged, it was a massive privilege, my only visit to Pakistan, to be part of, of um, uh, the conference for SPELT, which is the Society of Pakistan English Language Teachers, 
and uh, they they in those days uh, organized an incredible conference they had an opening conference in karachi and then the speakers split into two groups and traveled around the country and took their conferences to different parts of pakistan and we went to abtabad to modern age uh, school here's a, a, a here's modern age school here are the boys doing doing something or other uh, uh, and they seemed um uh, very happy but i'm slightly nervous about the guy with the stick but that's neither here nor there any rate so we had about 250 teachers and and if you look up we were in the room above where the gentleman is standing and about 250 teachers and there we were in pakistan now before i went to pakistan with my powerpoint in uh, and my uh, you know knowing they'd have a projector i checked and all that kind of thing before i went there um I sort of thought I'm going to be really conscientious and well prepared. So I got all my slides and I printed them off onto overhead transparencies, uh, which I'm sure most of you will remember what they were. Um, and I cut them into little strips so that I could put them on the overhead projector and make it all look rather sweet and lovely. So that when, if and when the projector failed, or if there was some inability to hook up with between the projector and the computer or the plugs weren't right or something well that would be all right because i'd have my overhead projector some of you will probably guess what's going to happen in a minute uh, and so i said well in the talk in the room could we have please an overhead projector there sort of lined up with a screen as well as uh, the computer uh, uh, and the projector so uh, i started giving my talk about 250 teachers big overhead fans whirring around and things like that and suddenly, in the middle of my talk, suddenly, uh, boom, everything failed, just like that. The fan stopped, the projector died, the computer went boom. And I, and I, so I looked at the audience and I said, probably the stupidest teacher question I've ever asked. I said, what's going on? And they replied, oh, it's a power cut. And uh, I said, oh. That's a pity. Um, how long do you think it'll last? And they said, well, it's usually about a day or so. And I thought, well, that's all right. I've got my overhead transparent. And then in my head, I said a few words, which I'm not going to repeat in this uh, respectable gathering. And, and had a moment of absolute blind panic. What do I do now? What do I do? What do I do? But of course, what I did is you just carry on and did i do a good job not particularly but i just did it you just have to that's what teachers do when things go wrong or or unexpectedly teachers of all the professions i know teachers have this ability to uh, good teachers have this ability to 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 roll with it uh, and so we got on with the talk and we kind of um, finished it more or less. As I say, it wasn't a great talk or anything. Why am I telling you this? I'm not trying to say, look at me, look at me. I'm just saying, you know what? It's what teachers do, what we've always done. What teachers have always done is to try and adapt to what happens in front of us. And that's what I'm seeing in this lockdown world we're suddenly inhabiting amazing examples of that i want to say something just a little bit more about what the online world is i told you and forgive me this is i'm not trying to um uh, uh promote some other aspect of myself but as i've said i uh, i about a big proportion of my life is not just English language teaching, it's music. It just happens to be my hobby. It might be football or cricket or, I don't know, or, or lace making or or cooking or, or bird watching or whatever. People have all sorts of different hobbies or running or just so happens that music is, is what, what fascinates me. And so I spend quite a lot of my time um, uh, um, sort of folk singing. Uh, hold on. Uh, folk singing uh it, it it makes me happy uh whether it makes anybody else happy is completely irrelevant probably not but it makes me happy so uh, earlier this year uh well at the beginning of this year i spent two and a half months outside the uk 
And as I came home, I was really excited because I hadn't been to a folk club in two and a half months. Uh, I hadn't been to orchestra practice for two and a half months, and I'd missed all that. Of course I had. So at last I was going to go back to the orchestra practice and the folk clubs and things like that. But within about four days of arriving back, boom, uh, lockdown started to happen. And I was due to sing together with a number of other singers at an event uh, some about an hour and a half away from where I live. I live in Cambridge in the United Kingdom. I was due to, to sing there. And um, uh, so I, I got in touch with the organizer and I said, is this still going ahead? Because we haven't quite locked down completely. Is this still going ahead? And he sent back this message. Alas, he said, an man called Brian Corston, I think it's off. I'll know and inform people tomorrow. So the next day when I was sitting, having my coffee at breakfast, I got a message saying, it's off. And so what did we do? Well, we went, we went straight online. We said, well, if we can't have a folk club uh, live, we'll do it online, you know, let's do it online. So we did. And here is a picture of, uh, of, of uh, 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 um, one of our sessions about a week ago. Uh, and there's, there are other screens of, as well. Uh, anybody between 20 and 30 um, uh, people uh, and if you look at that picture, I won't bore you too much, but uh, there's a guy singing there. You can see him outlined in green. And I remember so clearly he was singing a song about a shipbuilder, a traditional folk song. And um, I, the most beautiful lyric, it was about a shipbuilder. And it said, I carve the music of the wind into the wood. I just think that's so poetic. Anyway, stop, Jeremy. Talk about we're talking about teaching. So all of these people are amazing musicians. The woman with the harp was in Scotland. The woman next to her is the most brilliant flute player. There are people there. There's someone in there from Italy. I don't know. They're all all over the place. And we have these incredible folk sessions, which are really moving, and 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 and, and good fun. And we have our etiquette. Uh, when someone starts singing, everybody else mutes their microphones because you can't have um, uh, the, 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 there's a you, sound interview. You, those of you who've used Zoom know very well that it gets all very complex and complicated and different sounds and, and all that kind of thing. So we have a, uh, but something very special happens, which is almost better. No, that's wrong. Which is very different from going to a folk club where everyone's sitting around listening to music. There's something amazingly moving and powerful about a performance. Uh, the woman uh, on the right-hand side, second row down, a woman called Jean, just plays solo flute. Doesn't sound really interesting. But when you hear it in this situation, somehow it, it conveys immense power. Why is that? What's going on? Why is it so special? Well, in a different Zoom conversation with these people, I don't know if you, you may recognize some of them. There's a woman called Laura Patsko, and then a guy called Ken Wilson, who some of you know in, in ELT, a man called Mark Andrews uh, there, who some of you know. And this was just a, a sort of hookup. We were just having a chat. And we started to discuss what it is about the new online reality that most of us are living in at the moment that makes it special, or rather, that makes it different. And we had quite a long and extensive conversation about it. And this is what they came up with, or what we came up with. We said there's an incredible intimacy that is possible uh, in these online connections. We're not necessarily achieving it right now because you're all having to listen to me. And I can't read the, 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 the question, the, the, the comments that are coming up because they're happening too fast and I'm trying to concentrate. But there's an intimacy about our contact about our community, about our, our, our feeling of connection. Um, there's space because, and maybe this is a, a particular particularity of, of something like Zoom, but you can't have two or three people talking at once, it doesn't work. So people have space to talk. And there's a little anecdote there about uh, Mark and Ken, myself, Laura, we go to a lot of teachers' conferences. And the only times we have ever managed to talk to each other satisfactorily is when we found a corner, 
apart from the main conference to have a chat. And online, you get that corner, that space to talk. And what happens? Uh, people are present. They're present, or sometimes they are present in a different way. Listening, paying attention. Okay, it's just a screen, uh, but you focus on it. You pay attention in a way that sometimes in class with all the other stuff going on and the noise and the distractions and the, you don't you're not present in the same way and it's much less easy it seems to me to do what some pupils do students do in class which is just to zone out now you can zone out online you can just disappear off to the kitchen or something like that but it's more difficult um and and finally something that has happened which is rather extraordinary is that the quality of listening has got better. Indeed, the whole thing has become an area of heightened emotion. Now, some of you are thinking, what on earth is he talking about? He's talking about his own personal life and his own personal interests and hobbies, and he's not talking about being with 26 unruly students who are disengaged. I get that. I entirely get that. Uh, my job is not to say everything is perfect, because it's not perfect. It's bloody difficult to use uh, uh, this very high, high falutin language. It's very difficult. But I'm just trying to say that in the midst of all this, there are some uh, uh, real bonuses about connection and community and things like that. And we may be able to carry them through into teaching. But... Oh, sorry. Oh, just having a heart moment there. Everything's perfect, isn't it? No, it isn't. It's not perfect. Here's another of my students. And this was her experience after the first week of going online. She works in Wisconsin in the United States. She works at a community college uh, 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 teaching uh, refugees and immigrants and stuff like that. Um, vital work, fabulous work. And this is what happened to her as the lockdown started and uh, this is what happened yeah yes i mean she, she puts her finger on it doesn't it i think it works better for some than others well yes it works better for some than others now, I mentioned that conference two weeks ago, that online conference, and there was some some terrific stuff. So what we're going to talk about now comes from that conference. It comes from my own experience as an online teacher and from endless discussions I've had in the last five, six weeks, however long we've been locked down, with colleagues and professionals and friends about all of this. So what I want to offer you now, uh, um, is five routes to a better life. Um, this is, I'm trying to, uh, what, what's always been my, my role as a methodologist is trying to distill, it, it seems to me, maybe I'm wrong, is to, trying to distill or, or communicate what people are saying uh, about it. So here are some things that people have been uh, uh, saying about all of this. Um, and let's see how we get on. Number one, relax. Don't panic. Don't, don't get completely insane with worry. Well, you can worry about, you can worry about uh, the world and the climate. You seem to have forgotten about the climate. You can worry about inequality. You can worry about staying safe and well. But in terms of teaching online, uh, Relax. Uh, you can't know everything. The trouble about the online world is it, it, it eats you up. It's a monster. If you try and understand everything there is to understand about every single bit of technology you could use and how it would work and whether you can do this or that, you'll go insane. This happened to some people. You could almost see them going insane in front of your eyes at the beginning of Web 2, way back that some of us remember, when the digital world suddenly came charging into the world of education and people just freaked out. But you can't know everything. You can't know everything. Uh, 
relax, everyone's in the same boat. We're all in this together. This time we really are all in this together. Um, uh, relax, because for some people who haven't taught online before, it's not going to go swimmingly at first. It's going to be trial and error, bit of a mess, bit of an up and done. Just because it doesn't work today doesn't mean it's not going to work tomorrow. We get there in the end. So do our students, by the way. Uh, this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, whenever we try out new ideas in class, new lessons, new situations to present a piece of grammar, new this, new that, sometimes the magic works and sometimes it doesn't. But if we were downhearted every time uh, we made a mess of things, we'd, we'd give up teaching at least once a week. But we don't. We go back. We refine it. We get better. We work at it. We try and work out why it didn't work and then... Oh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, um, and if you think about my little story about the bank in Stratford-on-Avon, I think the most important thing has always been with technology to think about the things that we ourselves are comfortable with and see how we can use them. It was perhaps a massive mistake when, when we first started uh, talking about technology in English language teaching, that people kept throwing things at us, all this wonderful new this, this new shiny thing, this new app, this new this, new this, new that. And yet everyone was using technology already, whether it was WhatsApp or WeChat or Facebook or YouTube or whatever it was, all these different things, people use them in our everyday lives. So let's use them in teaching because that's what teachers have always done. Use the world around them to bring into the classroom. Uh, relax. Teaching and learning are just like life. Uh, well, no, they're not. Actually, quick, next one. Um, oh, by the way, uh, and, and uh, there's a really lovely Pearson site, um, and you it'll be put up on, in the chat, I'm sure. But there's a, a very nice link for you there, and they've got a whole lot of stuff about uh, teaching in in the days of COVID-19 and so on and so forth. Uh, very well worth a visit. Um, number two, let's go back again to the early days of, of uh, the kind of technology uh, revolution, evolution, whatever it was, um, way back. Uh, I'll never forget. Uh, a big international conference where people first came rushing in talking about using QR codes and 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 this and this and that and all these kind of stuff. And we were all so excited. But the problem in those early days is we got, we, we sort of put it upside down. People kept talking about the technology. That was what we were supposed to be excited about. Look at your new car. It can do this, that, and the other, and this, that, and the other. Whereas what we should have been saying is, what do we want to do? And are there any, is there any technology that can help us do it? The issue is not what technology you're going to use. The issue is what do you want to do? And is there anything around that can help you do it? So what are your pedagogic beliefs? Uh, we don't have enough time to go into them in depth, but but I, for my, if if I wanted to make a massively broad generalization, I would say that there are three things uh, that help students to learn. Uh, one is the ability to interact with the teacher, with other students. The ability to interact with texts, and by interact, I don't mean, I really don't mean just doing multiple choice comprehension questions and vocabulary fill-ins and find a word in the text that means. I mean interact. Interact with what is there on the page or come into your ears in some kind of listening text. So interaction is a key because after all, that's what language is about. It's about interacting with others, interacting with our own inner world, interacting 
with the language around us all the time. What else helps students to learn a language? Well, cognitive engagement, get, keeping their brains, getting their brains on board. I don't mean every EF, EFL student has to be a philosophy professor, of course not. But unless people are actively engaged at a cognitive level, we're kind of sunk, aren't we, really? Um, uh, and crucially, uh, we need some emotional engagement. We need good lessons, good learning happens when students move beyond the superficial. Now, there are all sorts of ways of doing that. And of course, amongst the, the people listening to this talk, um, uh, some of you are more passionate about teaching grammar than others. Some of you would rather be more kind of free and easy. Some of you, are, we've all got our own different uh, priorities and feelings about teaching. But however we do it and whatever we do, uh, unless students are at some level uh, emotionally engaged, head and heart, um, they're unlikely to find learning enormously successful. So if those are your beliefs, that's what should guide your choice of technology and your use of technology, it seems to me. What about um, the activities that you like, that you liked before suddenly classrooms were closed? Uh, what about, what are the things that you think, oh, today, you know, today's Monday, I'm going into class, I'm going to do one of those because I really like doing those and students seem to like it and they, they make, uh, I'm comfortable with them as a teacher. What about that? Can you still use those activities online, in Zoom, in Google Meetups, in Microsoft, whatever it is, in, in Click, whatever we're using now? Uh, uh, can you still use those? Well. Um, let, let's let's have a, a, a little look. Uh, here, here are uh, um, a few activities. Um, I've chosen them sort of at random, but so for example, a classic uh, um, technique from the early days of the communicative uh, revolution, way way back that I can remember, but most of you can't those days. Um, but it's still used. Is the one where. Uh, you put students in four groups, or five, but let's say four, and each group gets a picture, but the picture is different for each group. And they have to study the picture, look at it, make sure they understand what's going on in the picture. And then you, the teacher, takes the pictures away. And now you form new groups, and in each new group, there is one student from each of the original groups. So now we have lots of new groups of four students. And in each one, the four people have seen different pictures. And they then have to work out uh, what story the pictures tell. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're sitting there or standing there in front of your screens thinking, that's, that's so exciting, we've never heard that idea before. Well, of course you've heard that idea before, it's an absolute staple of, of, um, of, of kind of um, uh, freer practice, communication, uh, communicative activity, whatever you like. Can you do that online? Well, yes, you can. There are all sorts of ways you can do it online. Now, if you're using something like Zoom, for example, and Zoom is the platform I'm most familiar with, if you use something, well, no, that's not true. Um, on the MA, we teach using Canvas. But anyway, um, if you think of something like Zoom, you can have breakout rooms. Uh, you can separate the students into classes and quickly form them. And they, you show each breakout room uh, uh, a different picture and then you bring them back and you put them in different breakout rooms there are things you can do it like that and uh, if you don't have breakout rooms you can get the students to assign each other letters a b c or d 
And then you can do something which we often do in class. And you just have to trust that students are being honest. But why would they not be? Uh, and you say to them, OK, if you're group A, I want everybody to close their eyes. Don't look at the screen except for group A. Group A, have a look. And you show them a picture on the screen, sharing your screen as we are doing now. Uh, and then you bring them back together. Uh, there are all sorts of ways you can do that. The last uh, Pearson event I spoke at about a year ago, uh, pretty much a year ago, I think it was, uh, we had a lovely Pearson event um, the day before the Airtable conference in, in Liverpool. I think it was in Liverpool, yeah. Um, and I did something with, with the group that I hadn't done before and which I've now done quite a lot, and it, I love it. It's just amazing. It sounds so boring and so old-fashioned, but essentially, I gave, I gave the participants a poem, and I gave them eight minutes to learn it by heart. What's so special about that? Well, the beauty of it is there's nothing special about it. But putting the time pressure on people to learn a poem by heart has the most extraordinary results. It means that they engage with the language with an absolute intensity. They engage with the sound of the language in their heads, the pronunciation of the language, the stress and everything in their heads. with an absolute, absolutely ferocious concentration. And they work and work and they repeat and they repeat and they repeat and they repeat in their heads or out loud, it doesn't really matter. And then amazingly, at the end of eight minutes, uh, most a significant proportion of the people can recite the poem by heart. Um, I don't think I've got enough time to, to do it myself right now, but if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll quickly uh, rush it out. But it's a beautiful poem. Uh, there are many beautiful poems. And it's a really powerful thing. And you sort of think, the hat, you, we all have to be in the room for that. You have to have that, that sense, that, that tension, as you can feel everyone in the room trying to, trying to learn this poem. And it's great. It's a wonderful feeling. But you don't need everyone in the room. You will get the same feeling if you do that by sharing a poem on the screen and leaving it there for eight minutes, knowing that whoever is in your class is trying to learn it. I don't know how it works, but you can feel it flowing out of the screen, this incredible uh, intimacy and presence. Remember, those were the words uh, that me and my friends were using. Quizzes? Well, they're in some ways much easier to do online than they are in, in class. Uh, I've taken part, as I'm sure you have, in quite a few quizzes um, in, in uh, the last weeks, and they're silly and good fun. Um, and they involve the use of the mute button and all sorts of things like that. We'll talk about that in a minute. I was immensely impressed with a, a talk by a woman called Laura Edwards, who, who works uh, in the city of Dusseldorf in Germany. Um, and she described how she has used a typical uh, uh, English language teaching technique um, online in a way that is in some ways significantly more successful. Um, so one of the things teachers have always liked to do or always dreamed of doing is to invite a guest into the class for students to interview in English, to talk to. It's immensely motivating for the students not just to speak to the teacher but to speak to a visitor, immensely uh, 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 motivating for them to be able to engage with someone in a foreign language um, uh, who is who is new and at least for a time interesting to them. Uh, what Laura pointed out, uh, and of course it's obvious, but things are only obvious once people have said them, then they become obvious. What Laura has pointed out uh, is that of course you it's much easier to invite a guest into your classroom online because they don't have to go anywhere. They can just join up from their kitchen or, or wherever it is they're doing their online communication at the moment. But you don't just interview them online. 
you can do all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, so, for example, the first thing is to write an invitation letter or an invitation email to this person. And you can work online with the students using the chat box, for example, to create that letter and to correct it or get it in good shape. You can get students as a group or maybe in little groups because you use the technology to form them into little groups to come up with questions, the kind of questions that, that, um, that you want to ask your guest. Uh, then you can have your guest there and you can, uh, we'll talk about this in just a minute, uh, and you can make sure that it's well structured, um, that it's all, everything's sort of under control and well done. Uh, and then they can interview the person. When the person has gone away, or when, when, when yeah, when they've gone away, uh, then you can do things like um, uh, write reports of the conversation, write a thank you letter, uh, write things you wish you'd known and you hadn't known, and so on and so forth. Remember, follow the pedagogy, not the technology. The pedagogy says this is an incredibly motivating thing to do with students. Uh, and the technology allows you to do it. I don't know if you've taken part in any of those guest things, but I've certainly uh, been the guest in two or three uh, student groups, nothing to do with, with the pedagogy of teaching English, but just because um, I was invited to someone's class to talk about Oh God, this is going to depress me. The British attitude to Europe. See, we forgot, we've even forgotten about Brexit. Oh, heaven, I didn't say that. Right, moving on. Okay, uh, so uh, I think my point is, there are lots of activities that you like. There's a way around them, a way to adapt them, a way to bring them in. And it may not be as good as face-to-face, -face, or it may be better, but it will be different. But we can probably do it. It's probably going to be all right. Um, here's a big one. Uh, I've, got, I've got a couple more points to make, and then, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time. Uh, here's another one, the issue of class management. Um, this is the easiest um, education gig in the world that I'm involved in at the moment, because I've got the microphone and you're all muted. Perfect. I have absolute control. Well, that's not true. Charlie has control, but you get the point. Um, uh, but if you're if you're using a, a, a classroom, well, then um, it's important to establish protocols um, uh, and the students. Uh, it, I've just realized a terrible misprint. Uh, it says establishing protocols brackets as students. Hmm. It should actually say establishing protocols brackets ask students. Uh, because you can get you and the students to work out what happens. If anyone speaks, what do they do? Maybe they're just simple as raising a hand. Maybe we develop uh, 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 <coughs> um, uh, signals. Uh, when you speak and you finish your comment, you go like that. Or maybe the teacher has certain gestures and controls which say like that, or stop, or something. Now, these are things we do in class all the time. Why would it be a problem to do it online? But let's ask the students as well and get them on board with this. Of course, one of the things you can do is make videos to explain how you want your class to proceed and how things will work and to explain things. Uh, uh, of course, uh, as we all know, when you explain things to students, it doesn't mean that students have... have uh, internalized it and you're probably going to have to go on explaining it again and again and again and so on and so forth uh, the hand raising um use everything you have and feel comfortable with what is it that you feel comfortable with just bring that into the management of your online sessions uh i i this is another zoom related uh, comment if you haven't used zoom by the way um i'm going to put up a uh uh, a link to Sandy Millen's blog at the end. You'll remember Sandy is the woman who works in Poland and she's written a wonderful blog post about different ways of using Zoom and I couldn't recommend it more highly. Um, but anyway, um, the, the, the teacher in Wisconsin, you remember, who was worried about uh, 
uh, about her students uh, disappearing. Um, she, she says, uh, because in, in Zoom, um, uh, you can assign students to a breakout room. So they're kind of removed from the room. Or in Zoom, people are in the waiting room until they're allowed to come in by the, the moderator, in this case, the teacher. Well, she said, if students start getting a bit of a pain in the, in the where do you have pains? Neck, that's it, pain in the neck. Students got, start getting a pain in the neck, you just put them back in the waiting room and, and then message them and say, okay, when you come back, could you please? Uh, anyway, there we are. So lots of, lots of issues like that, uh, more things. Uh, students need encouragement. They're just as freaked out as we are and less motivated in some senses to make a success of it because it's less of a concern for them. They probably suffer, as we do, from this weird sense of disconnect with, with the world that we're used to. This weird sense we all have sometimes of uh, just thinking that things are just kind of, you can't really get, you, what the hell's going on or not going on? This is so weird. Uh, my I don't, uh, students have that exactly the same. Uh, students also uh, don't necessarily have, as I do, a quiet room, a quiet office in which I can work or do webinars or contact people. Uh, some students live in noisy families. Maybe there aren't enough computers around, whatever. So, so they need encouragement, they need help, they need us to be human and humane and offer the best solutions we can in their appallingly difficult circumstances, some of them. Um, uh, the, the third suggestion on this screen is, is vital, and this may have come from Laura as well, which is you know, get students to check on each other Teachers can't be responsible for everything. If a student goes AWOL, goes missing, well, find another student you trust to go and look for them, to send them messages, find out if they're all right. Use the student community to help each other. And maybe, maybe, uh, and this is what I was trying to indicate before, with this new world of kind of love and intimacy that seems to have opened up, and those are terribly strong words, but I think they, I think they, I think they're, I think they're appropriate. Maybe we can build a community sense uh, in our classrooms that that is not nearly so easy to create face to face when there's so many other sort of tensions and stuff going around. I was fascinated by uh, of the of the things that Laura Edwards said in her talk. Two of them stood out for me. And one of them was this issue to do with, with discussion. Now, we are very familiar with the fact that in classrooms, discussion is great, we love it, but some students discuss vociferously, loudly, and enthusiastically, and others don't. Some students need more time to think about what they want to say. Some students are not so extrovert and need, they want to process and think rather than speak, 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 speak. But the beauty of of uh, um, of what she's suggesting is is to say uh, that in a kind of chat room situation, you can set, give students time to write comments with no teaching going on. So that even the slow ones have time to process some things and write, and then you open up the proceedings later on. If you give t people time online to do things, instead of forcing instant communication on them, there's a chance that they'll uh, have a, a more thoughtful uh, um, interaction. Give students the chance to hang out without you, without the teacher, for the teacher to say, OK, um, we are going to have a five minute break. I'll be back in five minutes. Exactly. I want you all here. Uh, what we discovered on our MA is that the uh, the old proverb, which works in so many languages about the carrot and the stick, 
um, uh, uh, reward and 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 um, uh, enforcement of stuff really works. Uh, we we do it by the way by saying uh, the carrot is join our discussions, join our discussions. They will really really help you. And the stick is you get graded for your participation. There you go. Right. <coughs> um, and of course, the big issue, and I'm running out of time. The big issue is <coughs> if you're teaching uh, uh, non-adults, um, reach out to the parents, get in touch with them, enlist their help, explain to them what's going on, ask them how you can help, and so on. Right. Uh, nearly finished uh, uh, because I, I, I'm beginning to get entirely fed up with the sound of my own voice, um, as I'm sure you are. Um, and then finally, let's come back to us. We need to survive. How are we going to do that? Of, of all the issues that have ever faced us, this is a time for reflection. This is a time, uh, both on a sort of macro and on a micro scale, Macro, because this change in our living circumstances has made us think quite deeply about a whole lot of things we took for granted. Like, for example, in my case, hopping on an aeroplane every time anyone asks me to go and speak about something. On a micro scale for teachers, uh, I, I think... I think more than ever, if we can possibly do this, provided the kids in, in your family give you a moment's peace, or who knows, or whatever, <clears throat> is that when our sessions are over, to reflect on what's happened and to think about how you could make it work better, or to process what's gone on, to see how online will help um, uh, more than ever it's absolutely important for teachers to talk and share and talk and share online let's get together at the beginning of Twitter and Facebook there was a revolution of contact between the teaching profession uh, and then it kind of dried up as people got a bit bored with it. But now we really need to talk to each other. What do you do? I don't know how to do this. How does this work? Has anyone got any ideas for that? Really important. Um, we need virtual staff rooms because one of the best places in any school, well, or the worst, uh, but hopefully the best, is the staff room. We need virtual staff rooms. Uh, the power of online communication the power, uh, the presence, the listening, the silence, the, the, the space, it's so powerful and we're discovering that more and more with every day that this goes on. Use it. So, there we are, about to finish. What are you involved in? Is it, is it, is it an adventure? Uh, because it's, it's some of some of this lockdown experience for me, both professionally and personally, has been quite an adventure. I've had some really good times. I'm working as hard as I've ever worked, um, and and uh, but I've discovered some things that I that have surprised me. Or is it a nightmare? Well, yes, it's also a nightmare because most of the norms of living. Uh, that I knew, but that's not true. I mean, the norms of being getting up, going to the bathroom, having breakfast, uh, pu putting on clothes, that's normal. That Nothing has changed about that. Uh, but the other kind of facts of life, uh, not facts, the, the other, that, that's all changed. But uh, So that's a nightmare, and it's a nightmare. Uh, I am luckier than millions of other people, but it is a nightmare not being allowed to see uh, your daughters or your grandchildren, that's just horrible. Or, or anybody else uh, that you love and want to hang out with, uh, that's a nightmare. And it's a nightmare, it's a nightmare hearing uh, some of the terrible stories of of sickness and death. Uh, and, and, you know, don't normally talk about them in talks either, but this is where we are at the moment. But I tell you what I know, and that is that, that teachers are amazing. And what I've been absolutely blown away by 
to use a terrible old cliche, what I've been absolutely astounded by is, is the uh, intelligence, uh, creativity and sheer uh, energy that people in our profession have uh, used to get involved and to find a way around for the benefit of themselves, but mostly of their students and mostly of everybody uh, to get around the problems we're facing and seeing if there are ways of doing it. Now, uh, there's that link again to the Pearson site, uh, uh, absolutely um, worth its weight in gold. If you want to watch that panel discussion, it's free, it's on YouTube. Uh, and I couldn't recommend it more highly because the speakers uh, know what they're talking about and they're great fun. And so all you do is you put into YouTube, IATEFL colon global get together final panel, and you'll be able to watch that panel. And uh, and, and as I say, I, I want to pay tribute to Sandy Millen because I think she's be doing a startlingly good work at the moment. And that's her blog address. And I couldn't recommend more highly that you visit it and and see what she's got to say and that is everything i've got to say now i don't know whether we've got any time left for anything uh um i have a dreadful feeling i've overrun anyway um uh, but anyway charlie over to you hi jeremy thank you for those amazing insights that was a great session we've had lots of positive responses some quick housekeeping items before a few questions Certificates, recordings, and access to the Pearson English Spring Days goodie bag will be sent out within a few days. Certificates, recordings, and access to the online goodie bag will be sent out within a few days. Jeremy, I have a few questions here for you. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, first one, small detail. Could you explain what Edwards means about the chat room writing? You mentioned <laughs> it in the slide. Oh. Yes, I've mentioned that, and, and you, I, I, basically what she's saying is, is that in discussion, in ordinary discussion, uh, it's very instant and very, um, uh, uh, but she can say in the chat room, I want you to write about this, but we're not, it's, it's actually, you know, you write about it, I'm not going to look at it, uh, just take your time. And you don't discuss what's being put in the chat room, until the time is over in other words you might say you have four minutes or five minutes to think of things you want to write and put them there uh, and and uh, nobody uh, the other people can react but the teacher doesn't react and it's not brought into the kind of public forum or online until four minutes are up or whatever the time limit is and then it is and and her point was or maybe they can write on documents and then share. I don't know, but but the point she was trying to make was, uh, um, was was that online allows students to communicate without having to be instantaneously fluent. I think that's the point. Um, and by the way, uh, as a quick uh, brackets to that, um, uh, on the MA I teach on the discussion boards are asynchronous, that is to say, we have students from different parts of the world. So they type up their thoughts and somebody may not read what another student has said until a few hours later, and then they have time and then they type up their thoughts. And it's not instant kind of instant, you must you must be fluent, you must be fluent. It's 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 gentle and laid back. You there, Charlie? Yes, absolutely. Sorry, just turning my mic back on. So going to be quiet. Oh, no, there you are. Yep. Uh, sorry for turning my microphone back on. Yeah. One, one more here for you. Yeah. You create. Or what's the best way to create the community feel that you that you miss from a face to face classroom? Well, all of the things that we were talking about is one answer. Uh, uh, that's too easy, but but I think one of the ways of doing it is to recognise uh, that, especially uh, in in the situation we find ourselves in, community is vital. So that when dealing with a class, uh, social chat is as important as it has ever been. 
and that time spent talking to students and with students uh, um, is really uh, as important as any teaching of grammar, is as important as any, any of that kind of stuff, at whatever level, beginner or advanced. Uh, and, and that if you want to build community in a class, you we need to talk to the students as people as as uh, this is terribly silly. i find myself thinking how ridiculous i'm sounding because we've always said that but it's more important than it used to be and then the other thing uh, uh, which many of you are doing already is to make sure that the community of teachers in a school are talking to each other the community of teachers in a region are talking to each other. The community of teachers worldwide, like this community we're all involved in at this particular minute, are talking to each other. That's what community means. And it doesn't all have to be technical. Some of it is just about that we've taken great comfort, all of us, from talking to people about the experience we're living through. And we need to carry that through into our professional lives as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Jeremy. I wish I could just read some of the comments out to you because we've got some really positive responses. I'm very pleased to hear. Jeremy, well, I think that's it for today. Um, again, please um, check out the link shared on the slides now to see, the more, uh, see more of the webinars we have on to offer. Thanks very much for joining us. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.